Hey, my friends, it's Tom with Watchman River. Thank you for joining me. It's another good day, isn't it? It's another good day. Kind of rainy here, 50 degrees again, but it's a good day. Today, I want to talk about the red cows, the red cow mania, and the rapture. And we'll get to that because we're waiting for the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. We're waiting right now. I believe it's the next event on the prophetic calendar. But before I get into that, I just want to tell you, got to tell you, what I'm having for dinner tonight, okay? So, and I'm not recommending you have this, but if it sounds good to you, then have it, okay? But once in a while, we get in a mood for like a breakfast, a dinner kind of thing. So, uh, you know, my wife is making a breakfast casserole today, getting it ready for tonight. You know, scrambled eggs and sausage and cheese. And I don't know, she puts all kinds of stuff and it's good. It's all breakfast stuff. And then I'm going to buy me some rye toast. And I really like rye toast with my breakfast casserole. I'm going to butter up those babies. And and uh, who knows? Might have little pancakes on the side with some syrup. You know, you got to keep it healthy. You got to keep it healthy. But that's what I'm having. You know, I if that sounds good to you. Maybe you should get busy and get that started. But uh, yeah, it's it's good. It's good. You know, you guys think. That I eat so much because I recommended and not recommended so many unhealthy foods. But you got to keep in mind one thing. I, I don't eat much. I eat in a four-hour window at the most. Sometimes I eat in a one-hour window every day. So I don't do breakfast. I do black coffee in the morning. I don't do breakfast. I don't do lunch. I kind of do that intermittent fasting because it seems to help with my Lyme disease. And it keeps me... There's a little bug in here. It keeps me... <laughs> You know, at 200 pounds, 210 pounds, instead of getting bigger than that. And I'm six feet tall, so that's not a bad weight. It's not too bad. You know, according to the government charts, it is. But, you know, but yeah, I, I don't eat all day long. I don't eat junk all day long. Just so you know, you know some of you worry about me, and I, I appreciate that. Anyway, let's start off. Let's read Psalm 23 before we get started, okay? Because everyone knows this psalm. It's one of the most beautiful psalms of all of them. And it's just great in this time period. Let's read it. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Man, you know, Jesus, we're going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Do you realize what that means? Do you know the future he has for you? If you know what he did for you, if you know that he shed blood for you to wash you white as snow and you believe in his finished work, man, you've got an incredible future. You have an incredible future. So let's get into this. What is all this cow mania about? You know, you hear about these red heifers and you wonder like, what's this all about? I'm just going to review the basics of it. Just so you know, we talked about this, I think last week or the week before. But we're going to talk about it a little bit because a lot of people don't really understand the red heifers, what's going on with that all that much. Okay, so I'm going to read a, a headline to you because this was pretty amazing. This happened about, uh, well, this, this headline was from this morning, but this was reported about a week ago. I covered it the day it came out. Hamas spokesman blames Israel's importing of red heifers for the October 7th attack. Okay, listen to this. When Abu... Obeda, or Abeda, a military spokesman for Hamas, began his televised speech marking the 100 days since the October 7th attack last week. Most of what he said followed the familiar mantra of praising Hamas military resistance and calling for all Muslims to rise against Israel. You know, normal protocol. But as he began listing the motives for the October 7th massacre, he said that the aggression against our path and Al-Aqsa, the mosque, reached its peak with the bringing of the red cows. Who could have ever thought these red cows could cause so much trouble in the world? 
To much of the world, such a statement sounds strange, as they are not aware of traditional Jewish beliefs regarding the red heifers used for purification. The bringing of the red cows, which he was referring to, was the 2022 arrival of five red heifers to the Temple Institute. That's the people that are talking about building the temple. They're getting ready. They have everything they need. They're just waiting for the political go do it. Uh, a Jewish organization focused on establishing the third temple on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. The heifers are quietly being groomed by the Institute for their ultimate goal. The rare animal, very, 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 we'll get into how rare that animal is, but the rare animal is the main component in a ritual purification ceremony for cleansing ritual impurity and proximity or contact with a dead body. Since the destruction of the second temple, that was 2,000 years ago, just about, all Jews today are considered ritually impure, thereby preventing the return of the temple service and even entering the holy places on the temple mount. So, you know, 2000, for the last 2,000 years, they couldn't get a red heifer. They couldn't get one. There was none to be found. Every time I remember getting very excited, I think it was the late 90s, early 2000s, they found a red heifer. And it was perfect. And then it grew some white hairs. And it was disqualified. It's very, very, for 2,000 years, they haven't been able to get a perfect, unblemished, because it's got to be completely perfect. It can't have one white or gray hair on it. It's got to be perfect. And they only need one to sacrifice. So Texas comes along, this dude in Texas, and he, it's the perfect storm. Like, it, it is the perfect storm. He doesn't only have one red heifer. He has five of them. And he sends them to Israel. And the, there's so many amazing things about it. Because you have to tag, I guess, I, I don't know that much about farming and cows and cattle, just so you know. But you, I know you have to tag them. It's kind of a law. You have to tag them. But... There was some weird thing in, during COVID where they didn't have to tag them because if he had tagged the ears of any of these red heifers, they would have been disqualified. They weren't perfect. But COVID was the perfect storm. He didn't tag the cows. So he comes up with these five perfect red heifers and he sends them to Israel. Now, my whole thing is, what a coincidence that exactly give or take a few years, 2,000 years after Jesus is crucified and resurrects the church age, right at the end of it, and we're within that time period, red heifers show up. And those red heifers, they only need one, and they could, they think they can sacrifice one this year. What a coincidence. Is that just a coincidence? 2,000 years after Jesus, and anyone who understands that the creation plan is a 7,000 year plan because God loves that number seven, completion. And you realize Adam to Abraham was 2,000 years. Abraham to Jesus was 2,000 years. Jesus to now is two more thousand years. So we're right at the end of 6,000 years since Adam and Eve. And there's 1,000 more years to go. And that's when Jesus is ruling and reigning on a throne in Jerusalem. It's the millennial reign. And it's after the rapture and after the terrible seven-year tribulation. Jesus will be there for a thousand years. So right when we're at this place, switching from the end of the 6,000th year to the beginning of the 7,000th year, these heifers show up. That's a miracle from God. I don't care what anyone says. That is that is incredible. We know, we know there's going to be a temp temple built. Why do we know that? We know it because in the Bible, it talks about the Antichrist entering into the temple halfway through the seven years and stopping. You know, first, the beginning of the seven years, he signs a covenant and it allows Israel to sacrifice and to have their temple. It's going to be after the rapture, right after the rapture, I believe. We know he enters in halfway into the seven years and says, like, worship me. And he stops the sacrificing. And he says, worship me. Now let's go to scripture. Let's look at because Jesus referred to it and it referred to Daniel, the prophet Daniel, in Matthew and in Mark. We'll read Matthew 24, 15, 16. Jesus said, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, that's the Antichrist 
entering in halfway through and stopping the sacrificing. Spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place. And I love this. Whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. That's the halfway mark in the seven-year tribulation. And that's when all the Jews have to flee immediately. Don't go down and grab your coat. Don't go, just go. And we believe, most people believe, not everyone, that they're going to Petra. That rocky place with a small opening and they'll be protected there for the second half of the tribulation. In Mark chapter 13, verse 14. So when you see, this is the words of Jesus again from Mark. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. So there you go. They're talking about a third temple being built. We know there's going to be a seven-year covenant. And the red cows, you know, Hamas, like they, the Hamas leader lets the red cow out of the bag. <laughs> and basically says, we did these attacks because of those red cows. That's one of the reasons. Like, that's major. We're watching Bible prophecy set up right in front of our face. It leaps off the pages every day, every single day. And you just look at, like, if that is true, and I believe it is, that that was one of the reasons they did it. It's like, man, these, these candy apple cows, they show up after 2,000 years, and they're completely perfect, and they're causing a storm in the Middle East, or at least contributing to a storm in the Middle East. Jesus is coming soon to rapture his church. That's kind of the bottom line here. Paul said, I don't have to write to you about the seasons and the times and the seasons. You'll know we're in the season. We're in the season. The rapture's not 10 years away. The rapture's not 20 years away. We're in the season. We are about to be face to face with Jesus. Am I going to give you a day or an hour? Absolutely not. No way. I'm not even going to guess at one. But I'm going to tell you all the signs have converged. Everything is set and we're waiting. We're looking up. We're trusting Jesus and we're waiting because he's going to come in his perfect timing. Perfect timing. Okay. All right. Let's see what else is going on. Right before I hit record, the International Court of Justice in The Hague, they, they're meeting to give their decision on the lawsuit brought by South Africa uh, accusing Israel of genocide. So it says the International Court of Justice in The Hague on a 15 to 2 vote demands Israel take all measures to prevent acts of genocide in Gaza. They did not order a ceasefire in the ruling. The court turned down South Africa's request for Israel to stop military action in Gaza, which kind of surprised me, honestly. And just, you know, off the cuff here, uh, as soon as this was going on, uh, rockets started firing into Israel as soon as this decision was announced. But And it was Hamas from Gaza firing rockets. So, And they haven't done that in a little while, so... But anyway, this is Amir Sarfati, his Telegram post. He had a couple posts about this, and I, I always like to see his take on things. He said, the Hague Tribunal rejected Israel's request to reject South Africa's claim. The court in The Hague, at this time, hands down its initial decision in the lawsuit against Israel filed by South Africa. The court claims that it has the authority to discuss South Africa's claims that Israel is committing genocide in Gaza, but in the court's opinion, it is not possible to determine at this stage whether this actually happened and, and it should be clarified in the court hearing. Israel is required to take immediate steps to enable the provision of basic services and humanitarian aid to Gaza. They've been doing that. Hamas takes every truck. And right now, the Jews are blocking some of those entrances, waving flags, not letting them. Some of the families of the hostages are like no more aid trucks and they're blocking them i think yesterday only five trucks got in and usually it's a lot more than that but anyway also in addition the judges state hamas must immediately release the abductees you think that'll happen no it ain't gonna happen i don't think so and then he said bottom line with the international court of justice in the hague israel isn't required to stop the war 
Hamas was demanded to release all hostages. Israel isn't even ordered to allow the population back to their homes. The corrupt South African ANC government better invest its money on better endeavors. Yeah, it kind of backfired on them. It didn't work out too well. But, you know, I always tell you, Hamas is winning the PR war around the world. So they will uh, somehow, they'll spin this and it'll turn into Israel lost. <laughs> they lost this round. All right. What else? Hezbollah attacked an intelligent gathering facility on the northern border. They've been doing this. They were shooting at the cameras. They were, they're trying to mess up all the security on that northern border. And so far, they're pretty successful. But Bubba News, my friend on Telegram, great guy. This guy's a great guy, but he, smart guy. He said, just a quick update on Israel's northern border and Hezbollah. Hezbollah is slowly chipping away at the protection on Israel's northern border. Much bigger stuff is coming. The coming attacks on Tel Aviv and the ports of Ashdod and Haifa will be crazy. Once they have the northern border all but destroyed, Hezbollah will get the go-ahead for, for a major attack. They are playing a waiting game. They know the ball is still in their court. They are patient and just waiting for the right trigger. In Psalm 83, 7 and 8, it mentions the representation areas of Hezbollah, Tyre, which is Lebanon, and Assyria, which is Syria. Israel is preparing for a ground invasion by Hezbollah into Israel. The fear of a repeat October 7th attack looms large every single day. Israel has been preparing. Will Israel start the attack or will they continue to play defense? The IDF said they won't wait much longer. Yeah, they talked about, I think the IDF said to Hezbollah, like you have till the end of January to figure this out. Don't know. How, what that means, if they really mean that they didn't set a hard date, they just said to the end of January. So these are very fascinating times. And we just need to pray for all the people in that part of the world. Because, man, the whole world's in a lot of peril. It's perilous times. There's so much trouble in the whole world with these wars and rumors of wars like I've never seen. But we pray. We pray. All right, what else? Yesterday, the IDF struck an Iran Hezbollah airport launching a major escalation. It says the IDF on Thursday attacked a key Hezbollah Iranian airstrip slash airbase in southern Lebanon that was used for launching aerial attacks against Israel in a major escalation between the sides. That went on yesterday. Like I said, Israel, this was from the Times of Israel. Israel is said pressing mediators for Lebanon's solution by the month's end as combat continues. And it's just incredible. It's incredible. When they sent those cows from Texas into Israel, I remember just gasping and thinking, whoa, this is so major. It's so major. Will these cows survive? And from what I know, I'm not 100% certain in saying this, but the last I heard, one cow of the five was disqualified, I believe. I think there's four that are still perfect. All right, what else? Oh, boy. Should I share this? Well, how much time we got here? Uh, stop growing food and fishing. It's ecocide. <laughs> I, it's clown world. Anyway, ecocide was the term coined to recognize environmental destruction as an act of war. Britain's Jojo Maida made headlines in alternative news recently after her speech at the WEF summit in Davos, Davos, where she stated that ecocide needs to become, listen to this, a punishable offense and included farming and fishing. You know, if she had her way, if you're farming or fishing, it's a punishable offense. You know, it used to be, it used to be, you'd see the bumper stickers on the cars, no farms, no food. Did you ever think you would see the day where farms would become the enemy? Did you ever think you'd see that? I never thought that. I never thought I'd see it. I didn't understand. So like just to see this world, the elite turning against farmers and cows and now people, even, even when we exhale, they're saying it's, <laughs> we're heating up the planet. <laughs> it's just, where is it? Where is it? It's Clown World. Sorry, right, hold on. Let's get it. 
sometimes we need to we need to hear that because it really enunciates the clowniness of the world that we live in. <laughs> anyway, so these farmers, I don't know if you've heard about this, but Germany, France, Romania, Poland, Lithuania, farmers all over Europe are taking a stand against their crippling green policies. They're blocking highways. They're dumping dirt and fertilizer. They're just wreaking havoc. There's fires and it's happening all over Europe. They're standing up and saying, no, you're not going to battle against what can you, I just sometimes I just think they're battling against farmers like who feed the world. I It makes no sense. It makes no sense. But they see a world with a much smaller population and they want us to eat bugs. Kind of says it all right there, right? I'm not going to eat sea bugs. No. Scottish farmers are also <clears throat> saying that farmers are getting pushed to the limit and they've had enough. That, that earthquake that happened in Japan on New Year's Day, they're saying it caused $17 billion, with a B, dollars worth of damage. Bad. The last 24 hours, again, it was a pretty active earthquake day. 50 earthquakes over 4.0 and a dozen 12 over 5.0. Still going. They're active right now. Very active. This is not surprising because we're in the last days. But it, but when I, if I rewind my life and think about it, if I had seen this 20 years ago, it would be shocking. But Religious nuns, not the Catholic nuns, not the N-U-N, the N-O-N-E-S, meaning like having no religion. The religious nuns are now the largest single group in the United States. When Americans are asked to check a box indicating their religious affiliation, 28% now check none. A new study from Pew Research finds that the religiously unaffiliated, a group comprised of atheists, agnostics, and those who say their religion is nothing in particular, is now the largest cohort in the United States. They're more prevalent among American adults than Catholics, who are at 23%, and evangelical Protestants at 24%. So the people who say they're agnostic or atheists or don't do any religion, 28% in America. Can you imagine? Ever think you'd see that day? Pretty wild. Back in 2007, it was 16%. So that's a lot. That's up from 2007 to 2024. It's now at 28%. Incredible. All right, one more stroll through Clown World. Listen to this. I, and I'm, I know I'm running late, but you know. Google's new artificial intelligence powered browser could mark the end of the human internet. I said it. <laughs> Starting next month, Google, Google will begin rolling on a new experimental feature in Chrome, which is the most popular browser on earth. And, uh, and the portal through which an estimated 3 billion people read and contribute to the web, they're going to insert an AI writing instrument or a writing assistant. Writing on the web can be daunting, especially if you want to articulate your thoughts on public spaces or forums, the company says. Chrome's new tool will help users write with more confidence, whether they want to leave a well-written review for a restaurant or craft a friendly RSVP for a party or make a formal inquiry about an apartment rental. So no longer do they want you to use your God-given intelligence. They want you to use fake intelligence to write your reviews and to anything you write on the web. And it's coming. But but remember one thing. If you write something, if you include a thought that you want to put in it, but that artificial intelligence doesn't like that thought, they're not going to put that in. <laughs> it's, that's clown world. I, I'd rather, you know, I'm not the smartest tool in the toolbox. I'll tell you that. And I'm not what's a, I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer. <laughs> but I, I'll take my my limited writing skills over anything AI is going to give me. I'd rather leave a, a review that's a little uh, discombobulated about a restaurant than have artificial intelligence write me an eloquent, perfect review that didn't come from me. It came from them. It's, it's clown world. We're in the last days. Do you see it? I think you do. Let's do a couple testimonies of the day, shall we? Let's do it. Lady, Lady D., God saved me at 13 years old during the 1977 blackout 
in New York City. It was not in church. I was drunk off of old English malt liquor. I thought the world was coming to an end, LOL. God sobered me up and saved me real quick. I've been living for him ever since. What? That's only God. I mean, that's just so incredible. Lady D here is drunk on old English malt liquor, whatever that is. I never tried that. <laughs> it sounds kind of yucky to me, but she's drunk on that. There's a blackout in New York City, and that's what God uses to get her, grab a hold of her. <laughs> I love that. Thank you for sharing that. This one is from Michelle. Oh, the testimony about the child telling her mom to go to church. That was yesterday. God used the child to bring me to himself as well. My sister was born when I was 17 years old, so I was much older than her. My mom and I were searching for answers to the questions, why are we here? And why do we go through much so through so much pain and turmoil? When we went to a psychic, and of course, when we left there, we both got no answers. Not long after that, my sister came home from school and told my mom about another little girl in her class that shared something with her about church. The, this classmate of my sister's was so excited telling my sister about it. So my eight-year-old sister told my mom, we need to go to church. And we found a church. But more importantly, we discovered Jesus. Glory to God. My sister made it to heaven. Oh. My sister made it to heaven before my mom and I did. But in her brief 24 years on this planet, my sister was used in a big way by God. And I look forward to hugging her again after I hugged Jesus. It was the best thing in the world to me to have a sister. And I miss her terribly, but I know she is with Jesus. And I know I will see her again. I also look forward to thanking that little girl in my sister's class for sharing her excitement about church. I don't know who that little girl is and still don't know, but one day I will, and I can't wait to hug her and thank her too. Thank you, Michelle. How beautiful is that? I love hearing these testimonies about the Lord using little kids to reach us. Oh. All right, comment of the day. Here we go. Janet. In 2009, I went on a mission trip to Africa. I was telling a Bible story to some little children. Suddenly, a little girl ran away as fast as she could, and she came back with her mother, who was staggering drunk. She sat her mother down beside me, took her mother's face in both hands, and turned her face to me and told her to listen as I shared the gospel with her. She nodded in assent, but only God knows how sincere she was. But that baby girl's love for her mama has stayed with me ever since. Man, you guys are trying to make me cry today. Please. <laughs> Please. All right, Christine. I have never seen such spiritual warfare in all my 61 years of life. There's no doubt in my mind that the devil is attacking because his time is almost up. I am so ready to leave this ungodly world and be in the safety of my Lord and Savior, Jesus. Maranatha. Amen, Christine. I guarantee you, just me reading that, I guarantee you there's hundreds, if not thousands of heads nodding, saying, yep, because I'm 60 and I've never seen the spiritual warfare that's going on right now. Never. Never. Not even close. We're in the last days. Tammy. Good morning, Watchin' River family. The tribulation will be worse than mankind will ever see. Once we're taken up to be with the Lord, it's all going to be a total disaster. Yeah. It's not going to be good. Confusion will hit the earth because of the great disappearing of loved ones. Today is a great day for the rapture. Soon we will hear Jesus calling us home. Stay strong and armor up. Maranatha. Thank you, Tammy. Thank you. Let's do another one. These are good comments today. Hi, Tom. My name is also Tom. This week on Monday, my, hot, my heart stopped beating. My wife drove me to the hospital and it stopped beating again. After being hooked up to a heart monitor, it stopped two more times. I ended, I ended up getting a pacemaker. 
And one of my nurses was a young Christian, and she saw my new book that you recommended, God's Promises. And then we started talking, and we ended up praying for each other. It was a wonderful comfort during this scary time. Nothing like our fellow believers. Amen, Tom. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, everybody's buying this thing. Look, I, I don't I don't even know. I got this at Barnes & Noble on the shelf. And it's just God's promises for your every need. Mine's the New King James Version. I know some people are very against that. But, you know, I think they have it in the King James Version, too. I don't know if they have it in the Geneva Bible, though. But they have it in the New King James Version. But it is, it's a great book. And, I mean, I, I, I've read hundreds and hundreds of comments of people. I got my book. I ordered a bunch. I don't know. You can get them wherever they sell books. <laughs> I, you know, I always have to say that because people, oh, Tom's making money selling books. No, it's a book I picked up at Barnes and Noble and I really, I really go to it every day. I love it. All right. Let's do one more comment. Okay. This is from an account called Jesus is Coming Soon. The four horsemen of the apocalypse would be something out of your worst nightmare. Us with the Holy Spirit in us will be saved. I wouldn't want my worst enemies to have to be here for the tribulation. I want all to come to repentance and to be saved. Amen. No room for hate, just love. Jesus said, love one another as I, as, as I have loved you. Let's all pray for the unsaved every day and keep bringing people to the Lord. Amen. Thank you for sharing that. That's what we're trying to do here. That's, what, that's why every time I do a video, I share the gospel because it's so important for people to realize this isn't a time to mess around. This isn't a time to think, well, I'm just going to, when I, this is what I used to think when I was really little, like when I grow old, I'll get close to Jesus. When I, when I get old, I'll, you know what? You don't got time for that. If you're young, you were, you were placed here on the wrong time. We're in the last days and you have to make a decision for Jesus now, or you're going to find yourself left behind. And today is not guaranteed anyway. You could get hit by a bus. I, I hope you don't. I really, you know, watch out for the buses. But you could get hit by a bus today. Like, it, we're not promised our next breath. But on top of not being promised your next breath, you're living in the very last days. And, and the reason, I, I I don't get a medal for, for proclaiming the good news, the gospel. I just don't want you to be left behind. I just don't think you realize how close we are and how serious that seven-year tribulation is. I just went over the seals yesterday in my video and how serious that is. I don't want anyone to be left behind. You don't have to be left behind. Jesus did something 2,000 years ago. We're in the church age right now and it's about to wrap up, but he did something that's so miraculous that I can't comprehend it. I never, ever will be able to on this side of heaven. And I can't wait to hear him talk about these things in heaven. But 2,000 years ago, he left a throne in heaven and he put on human flesh. He was born in that manger, in that feeding trough in Bethlehem. And he came here for one reason and one reason alone. He didn't come just to visit us. I think I'll go visit the people that have been created on earth. I think I'll go visit my creations. No, he, he, he came here to die. He came here knowing he was going to die. He came here knowing that he was the Lamb of God, the only begotten Son of God, the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. It was always the plan. If mankind falls, Jesus himself would rescue us. And that's exactly what happened. The Old Testament, you know, they wanted rules and they got their commandments. They didn't follow them, but they got them. They got a lot of rules. They wanted sacrifice, and they, they got to sacrifice their animals. And if the sacrifice was accepted, their sins were covered for a year. But it was all pointing to Jesus. The one and for once and for all payment for sin, that precious blood of Jesus that Jesus shed, that will wash you white as snow. It will remove all your sins away from you as far as the east is from the west. That's what Jesus did 2,000 years ago. He came here to die for your sins. So I'm here to tell you, your sins have been paid for with blood. And I'm not just talking about some sins, this sins, that sin, you know, oh, I smoked. I No, every sin you've ever committed was paid for by the blood of Jesus. A very, 
very serious payment for your sins. I'll never understand it. I say this all the time. I'll never understand how the one who spoke and created everything with the power of his words, Jesus, is the same one who came here as a suffering servant. He came here to die on a tree, die on a cross, to pay for our sins. Why would he do that? Because, you know, you may believe in him or not, but I'm going to tell you right now, like if you have breath in your lungs right now and you're walking this earth, he loves you and he paid for your sins with his blood and he wants to spend eternity with you. He doesn't want anyone to perish. So he came here and he paid for your sins with blood. Now you're left with the choice because it's the greatest decision you ever have to make in your life. It's the only important decision. Every decision you make on earth only affects you while you're alive, right? Except this one decision. This decision affects your entire eternity. Will you say to Jesus, Jesus, I'm a sinner. I know I am. I need payment for my sins. I'm finding out, wow, you paid for my sins with your blood. You went to that cross knowing that every sin every man ever born had committed was placed on Jesus on that cross. And his blood is so powerful. It has the power to remove everyone's sins. Everyone. And your decision is, do you want to say, Jesus, I believe you died for my sins. I believe that you shed the blood that will wash me white as snow. Please forgive me of these sins. And I believe you were put on that cross and that you died and you were buried, you were placed in a tomb and you rose again on the third day. Because when you believe that, you are saved. When you say to Jesus, forgive these sins because I believe in the power of that blood and your finished work, he, he removes your sins from you as far as the east is from the west. It's the most important decision you have to make in life. Because I have to tell you, if you reject this and say, I don't want this for my life. I don't want this. I'm not going to believe this. You're going to face Jesus. You cannot believe in him. You will face him on judgment day. You will see the nail scars in his hands and you will know I am standing before the one who died for my sins. I am standing before the one that paid for my sins with his blood, but I rejected that payment. And you will be led off to hell. Eternal separation from God. And you won't say it's unfair. So I'm just trying to point out, you have one decision that matters for all time. Will you ask for forgiveness for your sins and turn to Jesus? Will you trust in his finished work? That's repentance. Turning from unbelief to belief. You didn't know Jesus, and now you know him. You didn't believe in the power of his blood, and now you believe in the power of his blood. You didn't believe in his finished work, now you believe in his... That's repentance. You're turning from your old way to believing in Jesus and being rescued. And you have a bright future ahead of you. Eternity with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and a ginormous family that's not weird. There's no weird uncles in heaven, you know. I'll probably be the weirdest guy there, you know. <laughs> but anyway, that's what I got for you today. Choose. Choose Jesus today. You'll never regret it. People will say, I don't want to, I, I don't want to turn to Jesus. I'm gonna I'm gonna be in chains. I won't be able to do anything. No, no, no. You're in chains now. Jesus breaks the chains, he sets you free. And whom the sun sets free is free indeed. But now I'm gonna shut the camera off and I am going to say a prayer for every person who watches this video today. And if we're not raptured today, and today is a perfectly good day for the rapture, but if we're not, God willing, I will see you guys tomorrow. I love you guys.